welcome back to Combat Mission Black Sea for a bit of blue on blue. This is a quick battle meeting engagement between Chap, who is playing as the Americans in blue, and myself, also playing as the Americans, just red. Obviously Black Sea is a lot more topical right now than anyone would like. There's a lot of open source imagery and video making its way onto the internet that give us some windows into modern warfare and it's interesting to try and plug some of what we see into combat mission. So this battle is kind of a test bed where I wanted to try out two things in particular. The first is the drone artillery team. Drones or unmanned aerial systems can be used effectively to both search for and identify enemy targets before allowing the operator to direct artillery fire onto them. Drones are a big deal in modern warfare they were certainly a game changer for Azerbaijan in the 2020 Nagano-Karabakh war and there's a lot of footage of them being used in Ukraine, including instances where they appear to be being used to direct artillery. Secondly, I wanted to try out the Bradley. The Bradley is almost indisputably the best infantry fighting vehicle in Combat Mission Black Sea, to the point that I've specifically not brought it to some multiplayer games because it feels overpowered. Meanwhile in Ukraine, while there are lots of videos and images demonstrating the vulnerability of infantry fighting vehicles, almost all of these are, or are based on, old Soviet designs, BMPs, BMDs and BTRs. These designs are sub-peer in terms of protection, crew survivability and, for want of a better catch-all term, spotting when compared to the Bradley, at least as it's modelled in Black Sea. So bringing the Bradley not only gives me the opportunity to use it against a human player, but allows us to get an idea of how important the technical properties of IFVs are in combat mission. And before we've even started, these two choices have some very important consequences. The first is that they are predetermining the size and composition of the force I'm bringing. This is a small quick battle, so both sides can pick what they want to bring with every unit having an associated points cost that comes out of a set budget. For this battle, the budget we've got is 5,350 points, and to get a reasonable number of 8 M2A2 Bradleys, plus the B-Fist fire control variant, I'm spending 2,805 of that. So that's half of my points gone already. Following on from that, a pair of RQ-11B Raven drones, a platoon of M109A7 Paladin self-propelled howitzers and a two-tube section of 120mm mortars to form the chunky part of the drone artillery team weighs in at 1,691 points. That leaves me 853 left over for infantry, which is not a lot. The Bradleys are part of an armoured rifle company because I wanted the M280 with the commander position occupied instead of the M283 where one of the passengers fills in, and I simply can't afford to take the organic infantry squads. So instead, I've deleted them and replaced them with three-man scout teams. This is much cheaper, and I retain some infantry capability, but it means I have a third as many soldiers as outlined in the table of equipment and organisation. This is interesting because I've unwittingly replicated one of the reported issues of Russian battalion tactical groups in Ukraine, low levels of manpower. This makes some infantry-centric tasks, like clearing dense urban or forested terrain, very difficult because there are simply not enough bodies to saturate an area to a tactically useful level, or to maintain combat effectiveness when the inevitable casualties happen. This is going to be a problem for me in this game because we're fighting over a town, surrounded by forested hill. Not only are sight lines generally short and disrupted by all the trees, buildings and slopes, but a lot of the treeless areas on my side of the map, particularly on the left, are still covered with light forest ground tiles. This is basically forest undergrowth that significantly slows vehicles down. In this context, it's probably best to think of these areas as being recently logged chunks of forest or something like that. These areas, combined with the forest itself, severely limit my ability to quickly advance out of my deployment zone. There are some open fields on the right, plus the main road, but these lead into the town, which is somewhere I don't want to get bogged down in due to my small non-casualty resistant force. Other potential avenues of manoeuvre, for example on the far left, are similarly unappealing because of how much the forest is going to slow the Bradleys down, not to mention the fact that Chap has a quicker, easier exit from his setup zone, 
and it's reasonable for me to expect him to be able to seize pretty much whatever ground he wants and defend it, forcing me to attack. In short, I have very limited options here and very little flexibility, primarily due to the force I'm bringing to the battle. The Bradleys have a lot of firepower, but they don't really have the range to maximise its potential and they have limited room for speedy manoeuvre. I don't have enough infantry to confidently attack into most of the battlefield, which I'll have to do because my opponent is going to be able to gain a lot of map control early on. Pretty much the only component of my force I think I can rely on here is the drone artillery combo. So I'm building my plan around that. What I want to do is take up some strong reverse slope defensive positions, not too far away from my deployment zone, as fast as possible, then dig in and grind Cap's force down with my artillery until I've gained some freedom of manoeuvre. My main effort is going to be to contest the Overlook objective on the right. This is the map's dominant terrain, overlooking the town and a good chunk of the centre. If I can seize it, then I should be able to exploit it as a firing position for the Bradleys and scouts armed with javelins they've taken from the vehicles. If Chap wants to fight me for it, he has a narrow avenue of attack that should bottleneck his force for my 155. I don't want to get outflanked on the left though, so my other platoon is going to secure positions over there, minus one Bradley that is going to dip into the edge of town in order to get its scout team into a building where it can see the far side of the Overlook Hill. This is not a tremendously good plan. It's very passive, and it relies heavily on a single system, but I'm really hamstrung here by the force I've brought to the fight. I have both Ravens up at the start of the game, and by the end of the first turn, They've revealed three enemy Bradley, two approaching the Overlook, and one advancing up the road on the left. The scouts in the town can also hear something that may be another one a few hundred metres around the corner from them. This is actually pretty good news. I've seen three, potentially four Bradleys, which I can guess equates to at least one platoon, and given me some high value artillery targets, the distance they've gotten forward on turn 1 has also reinforced my pre-game judgement that Chap is going to be able to get pretty much wherever he wants on the map firstest with mostest. It does mean that his forces heading for the Overlook are heading for a rapid rendezvous with some heavy artillery though. We agreed to each bring no more than a single target reference point, mine is on the Overlook Hill, and my crack company Fist is not only operating the Raven covering that, but thanks to his experience, the TRP and the specialised equipment in the Beefist has the artillery falling by turn 3. It's probably not done any damage with the first salvo, but I've gone for a light max fire mission which will essentially drop 3-6 to six rounds a turn while I adjust it around the map. Hopefully this will give me a good balance of duration and effect on target, allowing me to shift it around deleting things without running out of ammunition too quickly. I'm able to watch Shaps Bradleys kick out some infantry who appear to start moving up, but the Raven quickly loses sight of them under the tree. Meanwhile, on my side of the hill, I'm pulling the Bradleys back slightly so they have a bit more range to play with. The idea is to engage any enemy forces coming down through the woods from partial hull down reverse slope positions, and I've spread my handful of dismounts around to provide a screen. One of these teams is able to see across the centre spotting some enemy infantry moving through the woods near the edge of town, and an MG team moving up towards the Cemetery Hill objective on the other side of the valley. This just reinforces how dominant the Overlook Hill is, but also shows how far Chap has gotten already with his infantry. My Bradley in the town spots, engages and destroys the MG team with 25mm cannon shells as they enter its field of fire, but I suspect this has done little except let Chap know where my Bradley is. By now, I'm reluctant to move it, given the chance that it will be exposed to his troops up on the Overlook. It's really in a bad position. However, Chap seems mostly focused on securing the Overlook itself right now. He knows I have something waiting for him at the bottom of the hill. Not only has one of my scout teams decided to javelin and Humvee in the middle of town, but his infantry can surely hear my Bradley. It looks like he very quickly throws on an attack. A 120mm mortar barrage falls on the bottom of the hill, killing two of my scouts and wounding two more, followed up with 25mm area fire from Mr. Bradley. Two of these are at the top of the hill, but another is tucked up against the building in the town, firing over a tall wall. My Bradley 1-3, a little further back on the right, spots it and engages with its cannon, but can't quite hit it behind the wall, and switches to the toe. 
This is the Tow 2B missile with the top attack profile, and it knocks out Chaps Bradley with a shaped charge going straight down through the engine grill and brewing it up. As I bug 1 3 out on the next turn in case it's given its position away, Chaps starts to move up on the overlook. The first effect of this is that his right hand Bradley dodges a 155 salvo. It misses by about 10 seconds and then goes on to add insult to injury by winning the spotting race against my Bradley 1-1. 1-1 takes some cannon rounds as the enemy Bradley comes over the crest, never spots it but at least it pops smoke and reverses out of trouble without any significant damage. A few seconds later, on the other side of the clearing, my Bradley 1-2 spots some enemy infantry cresting the slope up ahead and cuts them down only for a few stray HDI rounds to hit the enemy Bradley behind them. 1-2 doesn't spot this until it's too late and gets a burst of 25mm AP through the turret, killing the gunner and writing the vehicle off. It's a pretty disappointing turn, especially given that I was expecting my Bradleys to have the advantage on the reverse slope, but exactly the same thing happens on the next one. 1-4 spots some enemy infantry and engages, but doesn't spot the enemy Bradley right next to them. This finishes wiping out one of my scout teams and nailing the bailed out driver of 1-2 before turning on the 4. Again, my Bradley is colandered before it can react, with all three crewmen being killed. It's easy to have a moan at combat mission here because this whole engagement didn't work the way I wanted it to. But that happened. War is the realm of chance, chaos and confusion. Things inevitably go wrong casualties and losses are inevitable, and a small compact force is much more vulnerable to all this inevitability than a larger one. On the plus side, Chap has also taken some infantry losses and just before 1-4 is destroyed, he reverses one of his Bradleys back into the incoming 155s where it's destroyed by a near miss. This prompts Chap to pull his other Bradley back and closes off the engagement. This is really important because for my original plan of wearing the enemy down to work, the battlefield needs to be reasonably stable. The fight beneath the overlook has gone pretty badly, but Chap has pulled off at the last moment before blowing through my force completely. I can use this breathing space to bring 1-3 up in support and continue to target my 155s on anything the drones can spot. The first casualty here is the remaining overlook Bradley. It looks like Chap has been using it to transfer more infantry up to the top of the hill and I'm able to catch it with a direct hit. Following on from this, the other drone has spotted what appears to be an enemy infantry squad waiting beneath some trees on the left and I've hit them with precision 120mm airburst. This causes at least one casualty, it's hard to be sure, but the effect is also psychological. Being on the receiving end of heavy artillery or mortars that either chase you around the map or hit you without warning is very uncomfortable, especially when units you thought were safe are targeted, you don't know where the drones directing it are, and you have no means of countering them. In return, my main problem is Chap's infantry. He's definitely trying to get a javelin team into position on his side of the overlook, where it turns out it probably can just about see one of my Bradleys on the opposite flank through the trees. I've smacked that team around with the 155s, shot it up with some 25mm cannon, and they have almost certainly taken casualties, but they're still persistent. And they're a threat I have to take seriously. Now that my scouts on the flank of the Overlook have been wiped out, I don't have any eyes covering the Far Valley side, and Chap is able to get a Javelin team into position where it can spot my Bradley in the town. 2-2. Two, 2-2 two. Two, two spots the launch, but Javelin is a fire and forget weapon, so although some 25mm rounds land near the operators, it doesn't help. There are no survivors, and 2 2 scout team suddenly looks very lonely sitting in the middle of town. I spot something else down there that takes my eyes off the ball for a second, too. Chap has brought an Abrams along. This is a juicy target, and I just halted the 155 fire mission in order to cut it down from 3 to 2 guns and keep it going longer, so I take the opportunity to try and hit it with a precision mission. Past combat mission experience shows that the Abrams is perhaps not as vulnerable to 155mm high explosives as I'd expect, but I'm perfectly happy if I can degrade its sensors or just immobilise it. Unfortunately, Chap has very quickly learned how to operate in this kind of drone artillery environment and moves it off before the mission comes in. 
So not only are the Bradleys not performing, and my infantry is too low in numbers to get anything done, but my opponent has pretty much negated my drone artillery team by the simple exploit of not staying in one place for too long. While I'm messing around with that, Chap calls some mortars in at the base of the Overlook, demonstrating the effectiveness of simply dumping a load of dumb high explosive where you think the enemy might be. One 120mm mortar bomb hits Bradley 1-3, but is mitigated by the explosive reactive armour on the front slope. Thinking I've gotten away with it, because surely the Bradley isn't going to get hit twice in what's obviously a fairly wide fire mission, inevitably leads to a near miss that cripples the tracks, and then a direct hit on the unprotected rear compartment. 1-3 is knocked out. A little while after that, the enemy javelin team on the Overlook, which I've taken my eyes off, gets a missile away signalling the end of 2-3 out by the road on the left. This is not going well, and Chap knows it. Having realised that he's not only not up against a force as big as he originally thought, but that he's actually inflicted some serious losses on it, he starts to get a lot more confident. The Abrams is a star player here, performing shoot and scoot attacks that you simply can't pull off with ATGMs or automatic cannon, but that you certainly can with a 120mm high velocity gun. As a case in point, my scouts in the town spot the Abrams as it pops up in the distance, but before the javelin operator can even get to the window, they're wiped out by a 120mm shell. I am getting some hits in here and there. The surviving Bradley at the Overlook, 1-1, uses its cannon to cut down some enemy infantry, while I'm able to direct the 155s and the mortars onto the moor as Chap masses them at the top of the hill, but the trajectory of this battle is pretty clear by this point. As Chap mounts his final assault down the Overlook Hill, the Abrams remains frustratingly hard to spot from 1-1's reverse slow position, leading to me ordering it forward to see if it can maybe get some shots into the tank's side armour. Instead, 1-1 gets a 120mm shell that goes in through one side and out the other, knocking it out the turret crew bail into a torrent of small arms fire from nearby enemy infantry. Time for a ceasefire. Unsurprisingly, Chap has won this one with 677 points to my 155. I was never much focused on the objectives, because I was probably never going to take them until after I bled Chap's force down, but I've actually caused more casualty. Chaps lost 35 dead and 17 wounded for a total of 52, while I've lost 15 and 12 respectively for a total of 27. This doesn't look so bad in raw numbers, but the percentages tell a very different story. I've lost 47% of my force compared to Chap, who's lost about 34. That's not even starting to consider the loss of combat power in Bradley's. I've lost 6 compared to his 3, twice as many. But Winning in this battle was always going to be a bonus, the point here was always to see what we could learn. So, how did the drone artillery team do? Well, in raw numbers it accounted for 29 enemy casualties plus 2 Bradleys, or over half of Chap's infantry losses and two thirds of his IFEs. This doesn't tell the whole story though. I essentially ran two different drone artillery teams here. The company fire support team in the Beefist with one Raven and the 155mm howitzers on call, and the second platoon fist with the other Raven and the 120mm mob. The company fist racked up 23 casualties and the two Bradleys, while the second platoon fist only caused 6 casualties and didn't get any vehicles. Obviously, there's a clear difference in effectiveness between these two teams, and I think that's best explained by the kind of work they were doing. The company fist with the 155s was focused almost entirely on the Overlook Hill, which was always going to be the main area of contention. But even here, it was difficult to spot enemy infantry, especially under the trees, and although it was much easier to spot enemy vehicles, hitting them when they kept moving around was very difficult. Essentially, I managed to get lucky a few times. In the confined space of the Overlook, near a target reference point, with 1st platoon acting as a constraint on enemy forward movement. 2nd platoon's fist, with the other drone, had to do a lot more hunting for targets over a larger area of map, and barely ever spotted any. 
Now, there are some limitations to drones in Combat Mission Black Sea. In particular, moving drones around or changing what they're looking at involves at least a minute or two of observation mission readjustment, while in reality it seems like tilting the camera on the drone or flying it around is at the whim of the operator. This is somewhat mitigated by some features in Combat Mission Professional Edition where you can have more options for unmanned aerial systems. They can operate at different altitudes and they can follow targets that they spot, but drone operations still don't seem quite as reactive as they do in footage coming out of Ukraine. This was a particular problem with the Ravens because they are the smallest drones available to the US side with the smallest in-game observational area, a diameter of 400 meters meaning that Chap didn't have to move his vehicles around very far to get them out of sight. So are drones better used tethered in support of ground forces or as roving hunting target seekers for the artillery? This matter would suggest that in combat missions, with the limitations of unmanned aerial systems currently in game, coordinating with units on the ground is more effective. But we also have to take in the limitations of combat mission battles here too. These are essentially time-limited clashes between forces that correspond to set ratios in rough combat power without any outside context. Or in other words, not something we're likely to see in reality. In this context, we're dealing with a very shallow battlefield focused on the smaller tactical level, so of course drones integrated at that level are going to be more effective, and of course enemy units can afford to constantly maneuver to make tracking and targeting more difficult. This kind of movement can be a massive pain in the real world. It can make command and control much more difficult, it increases wear and tear on vehicles and troops, and it's not always possible. Certainly in this battle, I didn't have the resources to fix Chap in place, and he could afford to shuffle his vehicles around without exposing any kind of tactical vulnerability. But outside of the combat mission battlefield context, forces inevitably must take up static positions at some point, whether that is to dig in, conduct maintenance, refuel, rearm, or simply rest. There are all kinds of targets in depth that don't move around, and whose destruction results in the degradation or attrition of frontline forces. This is difficult to model in combat mission, especially in quick battles. This fight might have played out very differently if either force, or the support apparatus for either force, had been visited by drone-directed artillery the night before or while moving to the battlefield. Is this really a matter for the kind of company-sized forces present in our fight, though? I basically had one small Raven drone per platoon. This is a limited, short-range asset that simply isn't intended to go flying off over the horizon to place he can destroy. Something like the Raven is going to be better at providing immediate intelligence, surveillance, target acquisition and reconnaissance, or ISTAR, directly to company or platoon commanders. It's also worth noting that the Raven supporting the fight for the Overlook was controlled by the company Fist, sat in his B-Fist in a wood on the other side of the map because my priority was controlling the 155s. The downside to this was that the spotting information was reaching 1st platoon at the bottom of the hill second hand. The fight over there, and particularly the Bradley on Bradley engagements, could have gone differently if 1st platoon HQ was operating the drone and getting the spots itself. In other words, if the platoon leader was using it to enhance his situational awareness. The Raven can still be used to direct artillery this way, it may be slightly slower at this than if the company specialist does it, but its main role is really immediate low level ice star, not artillery fire direction anyway. Combat Mission Black Sea does model larger drones like the RQ-7B Shadow, which has an observation area of twice as large at about 700 meters, and would be more suited to the drone artillery seek and destroy game. I didn't use that because of the cost involved, and because the shadow can be shot down by man pads like this thing in game, which Chap brought several of along to the fight. But I think there's a clear threefold takeaway here. Different types of drones have specific roles. They need to be operated at the organizational level to which that specific role applies, and they need to be integrated into the overall plan. So, for example, at the Overlook, the Raven is there to provide immediate tactical I-Star, it needs to be operated by the unit who needs that I-Star most, 1st platoon, and it's there to support that unit as it contests key terrain. Some of that support may involve using the drone to help direct artillery fire, but that isn't the main role. A more effective drone artillery seek and destroy team would have been the company Fist using the larger shadow drone, at least until it got shot down. 
that's a lot about the drone part of the drone artillery team, but the idea of pairing them up also massively influenced how I used my artillery. It really made me focus on precision. The intent here was to use a light intensity maximum duration fire mission of one or two salvos a minute to delete one specifically identified target at a time before adjusting onto another. That's great when you can actually spot targets and when those targets are obliging enough to stay still. It's not so great when you find yourself trying to pick off an individual Bradley when there are two of them plus infantry bearing down on your positions. Cap's first push down the overlook slope might have gone a bit differently if instead of being chased by one salvo a minute, his force had run into a wall of 155 shells. The hill is only about 100 meters wide at this point, saturating it with artillery fire to destroy whatever was there and block it to follow on forces would have been entirely possible. It would also have been relatively easy to coordinate given the response time of US artillery in Black Sea and because the M109A7 platoon I was using comes with 180 rounds of ammunition in game, I would probably have had most of my ammunition left over for future use. Chap certainly dropped some non-precision type linear barrages on me with his 120mm mortars, both of which caused casualties and the second of which knocked out a Bradley. Artillery can work as a precision instrument in some circumstance, but fundamentally it's a blunt instrument and it's important to regard and use it as such. In a combat mission quick battle like this, where there is no higher context to worry about, there's definitely no reason to have any artillery ammunition left by the end of the game. I had plenty of 155 ammo waiting to be fired off and I had barely used my 120mm mortars because I simply couldn't find targets for them. This is partly due to the lack of observation and map control that I had, but also due to that desire to use them as precision weapons. Even something as simple as maintaining some harassing fire on the overlook may well have been a sensible option to make Chap's life more difficult. In hindsight, in this game I could really have benefited from occasionally invoking a bit of grid square removal, but really I had tied my artillery up with the idea of the drone artillery team instead of maintaining any flexibility. With the Light Max 155 mission going, it always felt like it was quicker and easier to adjust that onto whatever problem presented itself, even if that was going to be a subpar solution, because stopping the mission and calling in the right one was going to take too long. Again, it's an exercise in maintaining some kind of integration between drones, artillery and frontline forces, where they can actually support each other and not all be doing their own thing. Next up, how did the Bradley perform? Is it just as vulnerable as Soviet-era IFVs in a peer conflict? Well, the raw numbers would certainly suggest so. There were 13 Bradleys on the field at the start of the game and only 4 by the end. I lost 6 out of the 9 I brought, or 2 thirds, and Chap lost 3 out of 4, or quarters. 3 were destroyed by other Bradleys, 1 by an Abrams, 2 by Javelins and 3 by off-map artillery or mortars. It's also worth noting that the active protection systems modelled in-game, Trophy for the Americans, would likely have been a little help if they'd been present too. They may have saved Chaps Bradley from the Toe 2 attack early on, but the other instruments of destruction are somewhat immune to Trophy as modelled in CMBF, variously attacking at too steep an angle or coming in too fast to intercept. So what's going on? On the technical side, it's worth noting that the Bradley here was up against a lot of anti-tank weapons. Javelin, Toe and the Abrams 120 cannon are designed to take out much more heavily armoured targets than Bradleys, so they don't exactly have any problem dealing with an IFB, even a relatively heavy one. So the bottom few layers of the survivability onion aren't a lot of help. If you get hit, it's pretty much game over because the modern battlefield is that kind of place. The higher layers of the survivability onion don't get hit, don't get acquired, don't get spotted and don't be there, have a lot more to do with the tactical handling of the vehicle than they do with its technical properties. Which is a complicated and probably accurate way of saying that it was all my fault. The two Bradleys lost the Javelin, for example, were sitting stationary in full view of dominating terrain where I knew Chap had infantry. What were they doing sitting still? This comes back to having my options heavily restricted by terrain and force composition leading to a passive overall plan spiced up by the very questionable decision to isolate a single Bradley scout team in the edge of the town. 
dense terrain where enemy targets are likely to appear fleetingly at relatively short ranges is not particularly amenable to berm or pop-up drill. Here, my take was that the Bradleys needed to be in their firing positions already because if they were turret down behind the slope, they wouldn't be able to reach their firing positions fast enough to be effective. This is somewhat a component of playing combat mission in the turn-based mode, in real time when you can choose to activate your berm drill whenever you like instead of once a minute, it would be much more effective. But a major component of this is that I didn't have the infantry manpower to venture into the town or the forest in order to secure some breathing room for the Bradley. One three-man scout team per vehicle is not a force organisation capable of sustaining any kind of infantry casualties and then carrying on. If we were out on the open steppe or in Shock Force's desert plains, then a handful of extra eyes with a javelin probably wouldn't be too much of a problem, but it doesn't work here. Ultimately, any contact with the enemy will involve casualties, it's very optimistic to assume otherwise. And with such a low tolerance for those casualties, my plan became a lot less about find the enemy and destroy him, and a lot more about stay out of the enemy's way. If I had brought the full infantry squads of my two armoured infantry platoons, I would have had a lot more options, which would in turn have potentially led to a higher survivability rate for the Bradley. On the other hand, Chap brought plenty of infantry, certainly more than me, and lost a similar percentage of Bradley. But he did notably only lose one of those to direct fire, the one hit by the toe, and his infantry presence gave him a lot of map control and freedom to manoeuvre. It was very hard to hit his moving Bradleys, and even harder to hit the Abrams, because his infantry had secured enough room for them to stay out of the fight and keep moving. To put it another way, Chap was able to create and maintain those critical outer layers of the survivability onion against my direct fire threats with infantry manpower. I wasn't, because I didn't bring enough bodies. We're back to basics. Just like with the drone artillery team needing to be integrated with the rest of the force to be effective, infantry fighting vehicles need to be properly integrated with enough infantry to be effective. It's a symbiotic relationship. Infantry needs the firepower of IFVs, and IFVs need the protection of a casualty-resistant volume of infantry. Neither is likely to be massively effective without the other. So Combine Arms is the name of the game. Bringing infantry, armoured fighting vehicles and artillery to a fight is not the same as having a Combined Arms team. They need to be properly integrated in a way that they can effectively support one another, assigning the right assets to the right people for the right jobs, and operating with a force organisation that incorporates an effective proportion of elements. This is part of the usefulness of trying different things out in combat mission. Technical and technological developments are very important, there is a lot of impressive kit out there, but nothing exists in a contextless vacuum. Impressive kit does not win battle. People and organisations win battle. Sometimes impressive kit helps, sometimes it helps a lot. But the bigger the problems in training, manpower, doctrine and TOE, the more it has to compensate for. Hope you all enjoyed this one, a little bit of a different video. A big thanks to Chat for the game, I'll leave links to his videos of it below, and I'll see you all in the next one.